The following podcast contains mature language and discussions that are not suitable for younger audiences. The opinions voiced in this podcast are our own. We are not experts on the topic we present, but have conducted our own research. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome back to the Strange and Undecided podcast. I'm your host, Jarrett, joined again by my co-host. I'm Patrick. Welcome back, everyone. Hi. So this week, we're going to do another UFO episode. Once again, your favorite. Are you ready to begin our story? I was born ready. All right, let's get into it. Our story tonight takes place in Montreal, Quebec. More specifically, Montreal's Hotel Bonaventure. Regarded as one of the city's most prestigious hotels, it takes up the top two floors of one of the city's biggest convention centers, the 17-story Place Bonaventure. The hotel contains 397 spacious rooms, but what sets it apart from other hotels is the year-round heated rooftop pool, the two-and-a-half-acre rooftop garden complete with trees, flowers, and if the pool wasn't enough, there's also waterfalls and a jacuzzi. Bougie. While this might seem like an oasis or a paradise full of relaxation, on November 7th, 1990, Hotel Bonaventure was anything but that. That night, the hotel was the scene of one of Canada's most peculiar UFO sightings. So to do a bit of a background of the area in Montreal, during the early 1960s, Montreal experienced a huge real estate boom and as a result, a historic urban transformation. The Concordia Estates Development Company took this opportunity and submitted plans for a major project which involved the construction of a Canadian trade center measuring 2 million square feet. The idea was to build this place and lease the space available for various uses such as conventions, exhibitions, as well as office space and wholesale trade. The finalized plans for Place Bonaventure were determined in October of 1965. Construction of the brutalism-styled structure took just over two years to complete, and ended in 1967. What is a brutalism style? Stylistically speaking, it's concrete and very angular geometric shapes. I'll show you just a picture right now of the building itself. Maybe that'll give you an idea. So brutal, kind of like rough looking, rough around the edges. Is that the idea? Yeah, a little bit. This looks like a hospital. Yeah, when I first saw this, I thought, immediately it was a hospital. But a lot of the architecture involved in this was really popular at the time. Well, let's not go to Montreal. City of no taste. (laughs) Just this one building. Okay. At a jaw-dropping 3.1 million square feet, Place Bonaventure became the world's largest building at the time. You said the world's largest building in square footage at the time? Yes. Really? Yep. For a hotel? Yep. Damn. Exceeding even New York's Empire State Building. The building is an imposing feature in Montreal with its sandblasted concrete exterior walls and angular geometry. When finally opened, Place Bonaventure hosted various exhibitions from all over the world in Concordia Hall. One fascinating event that took place here was one that focused around paranormal events called the Montreal ESP Psychic Expo. That sounds like something we would really be into, to be honest. After looking into this event, I was able to find a website explaining said event. It mentions that the experience will delight your senses and enhance your quality of life. Some of the individuals hosting this event included the following. Mystics, psychics, astrologists, numerologists, clairvoyants, vendors, mediums, healers, and much more. I wonder if Hal Putoff was there. Are you familiar with Hal? I am not. Who's that? He he worked for NASA doing like exactly what you said, like ESP studies and, and like stuff for the government. And now he's involved with like Tom DeLong in his uh, To the Stars. Oh, interesting. Did yeah. he, was he active during the time of like 1990? I feel like he probably would have been. From my perspective, it seems to be catered to people who are, quote, open-minded seekers, end quote. People who seem to be open to psychic tellings and the paranormal which is quite ironic for what happened at Hotel Bonaventure on November 7th, 1990. On that particular night, around 7.20 p.m., 
an American tourist was enjoying the warm waters of the rooftop pool at Hotel Bonaventure. In the middle of her swim, she happened to look up and notice something strange in the hazy sky above, and it seemed to be moving towards the hotel. That night had a particularly high level of humidity near the ground, which turned into a thin haze extending from ground level to several thousand feet up. She could see what looked like green and yellow lights shining outwards centered around a large metallic object. This object moved slowly through the sky and shifted closer to the hotel. When the object finally came to a halt, it was directly over Hotel Bonaventure. It stopped there and idled, making absolutely no noise. The woman who viewed this event was shocked beyond belief and brought the object floating over the hotel to the attention of a nearby lifeguard. The lifeguard saw it as well and promptly notified the security guard of the hotel. Soon, over 30 people consisting of hotel staff and guests were now on the rooftop gazing at this UFO silently hovering over the building. So actually what was quite shocking was it was around 30 people, but there have been reports of up to 70 people actually viewing this event from the rooftop at different times throughout the night. All right, so pretty credible, unless you count people at a psychic uh, expo, non-credible. That's uh, up to debate. The expo wasn't going on at the time of this. This was afterwards. It was just kind of something that happened as like a precursor to this. More of like an interesting tidbit. Okay. It wasn't on the same day? No, it wasn't. It would have been really interesting though. Like how uh, far in between? I didn't get an actual date of the Psychic Expo. It was in 1990, so it was the same year, but it wasn't the same day. Okay. The UFO exhibited little to no change when the people were watching it. The only thing that did change was the lights would get brighter every once in a while. Before long, people started to get scared, and the management of the hotel ended up contacting the police. Management described what they were all looking at as maybe fallen debris from the sky, a satellite, or some other object from space. They also tried contacting the local airport to see if they might know what it was, but were not able to reach anyone. The lifeguard from earlier also contacted La Presse newspaper office to come and view the object in the sky. A journalist named Marcel Laroche was sent by La Presse to investigate the event. When he arrived at the hotel roof around 8.10 p.m., he was taken aback by what he was witnessing. He knew he had to get pictures of the UFO in the sky, especially because clouds were beginning to form and obscure the object. He contacted La Presse to try and get a photographer to come out to capture this, but nobody was available. He decided to run back to his car and grab his personal 35 millimeter camera and went back up to the rooftop. He was able to photograph the object in the sky through careful instruction over the phone from a photographer, and these pictures are still viewed as definitive proof that there was in fact a UFO in the sky that night. Also, this lifeguard is going above and beyond of their duties. Hey, let me, let me contact the press. Let me contact the newspaper. So we're just going to take a quick look at these pictures and we'll be right back. I will also be posting these same pictures in the show notes. So what we're seeing, some like distortions in the foreground is probably some cloud cover going by with the long exposure. Yes. And so this object, in order for a long exposure to be accurate, it needs to be like very still. So this thing like wasn't moving at all or? No, the object in the sky was completely stationary. And in order for him to kind of replicate the same thing, he placed the camera on its back, laying on a bench on the rooftop, pointing directly upwards. And he just clicked the button or held the button to do about a 30 second exposure. And this was the best result. There is another picture, which is much darker, which I didn't, I'll, Post in the show notes, but this was probably the one that circulated the most. So it's pretty shit. Um, the best I can describe it as is maybe like four faint lights in sort of a, maybe a circle. So anyway, context is everything for this story. Because if you just saw this photo, it would just be nothing. The first police officer to arrive at the scene was Francois Lippe. 
At the time, they observed a Cessna-style aircraft flying under the object and deemed it to be a much lower altitude in comparison. Wow. Under the object? Yeah, so the police officer and everybody else that was there were observing this thing, and they noticed an airplane flying underneath this object. And they could see that based on, well, again, it's kind of hard to tell when you're on a rooftop and you're estimating height. In the research that I conducted, I found a lot of varying estimates of how high the object actually was, but apparently this Cessna-style aircraft was at an altitude of 1,200 feet. And from there, they based how far the object was away from the aircraft. Again, it's really hard to tell when you're on the ground. Right. In an object that you don't know what it is, it's hard to tell. Is it really small and up close? Or is it really huge and far away? Like you have no reference point to something you've never seen before. Exactly. So I think this aircraft provided that kind of reference point. So when they saw the aircraft go across, they were able to kind of estimate that, yeah, it is far away and it's much larger than we thought it was. Yeah, at least they could tell it's probably farther than they thought. In my head, I imagined like pretty close to the hotel, but the fact that a, an airplane was still flying underneath it. So there, there was some distance. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmed by what he saw, he ended up getting in contact with his superiors to tell them to come to the hotel and look at the UFO for themselves. Soon after this conversation, Chief of Police Robert Masson arrived at the hotel and came face to face with the UFO. Using his detective mind, he tried to debunk what he was seeing by saying it was simply a optical illusion. There were spotlights illuminating a building under construction next to the hotel and had the workers shut them off, thinking that it may have been a reflection that they were seeing in the sky. When the lights were turned off, there was no observed change in the phenomenon in the sky, ruling out this theory. What is most shocking of all is that this craft stayed hovering over the building for nearly three hours. But nobody other than the people on the rooftop and just outside the hotel were apparently able to see this UFO clearly. Do you think because the hotel was so high up, it was far enough away from the uh, light pollution of the city? Well, looking at the area, it actually wasn't the tallest building in the area. The building that was under construction right next to them was, it was way taller and that's where all the spotlights were. So they thought, oh, maybe if we shut off the lights of this building, it would cause an, like a change in the lights that we see in the clouds, and it never did. Hmm. Strange that it was only viewable from this one building then. Maybe the lights from this object were focused on the building then? Yeah, that's uh, what people were beginning to think. There were reports made from around the city of strange lights, but not to the amount that would be expected for something of this size. Two airports, as well as a nearby military radar outpost, were contacted about the event and asked if anything came up on their radar or if they had any aircraft in the area. At the Dorval International Airport, their radar was functional the night of November 7, 1990. No radar contact was made with anything out of the ordinary that night, and they concluded that, quote, if an object was present, then it must have been stealth, end quote. The air traffic controller also stated that he received numerous calls from people reporting strange lights in the sky that night. The military base stated that they did not see anything out of the ordinary and nothing was picked up that was unusual on their radar. All visible air traffic was accounted for. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP, and military were eventually contacted along with NASA to investigate the sighting. Luke Moran, an investigator for the RCMP, arrived at the hotel around 9 p.m. He contacted the St. Hubert military base to see if anything was going to be done to investigate the object in the sky. The response was no. When Moran arrived on scene, he was able to see the UFO, but it was much less visible than earlier, according to other people who were also on the rooftop. As time went on, the clouds in the sky thickened around the object. By 10.10 10 p.m., the object was no longer able to be seen due to the cloud cover, and it wasn't seen ever again from the hotel. The following morning, the story of the UFO over Hotel Bonaventure was all over the media. However, the files relating to the case became classified within 24 hours of the event. Was the government hiding something, and did they know more than they let on? Yeah, I thought you weren't interested in investigating this military. 
Several years after the event, Police Chief Robert Masson stated that he felt the military was hiding something from the public and were not being truthful when answering his questions. He said, quote, I am convinced that I saw something that wasn't made by any inhabitants on this planet. There's no doubt in my mind it came from somewhere else other than Earth, end quote. So my belief is, if you're reporting this, so take our Shag Harbor incident in particular. The military was pretty involved once it moved to that secret military base that was off the coast of uh, Shelburne. The military got very involved with that. Or there was a whole fleet of boats that were sent out to go investigate it. In this case, the military was notified most likely multiple times from many different people and they didn't do anything about it. Yeah, and the fact that people were probably like maybe panicking, I can imagine. Like maybe this thing is a threat and the military just dismisses it. Seems kind of odd that you wouldn't take something serious like that. What was told to them was that no threatening, like nothing was happening whatsoever. No threatening acts or anything like that. Nobody was harmed. So they kind of just took it as, okay, we'll, we don't really care then. Weather balloon. Yeah. In their defense, it's kind of hard to believe something that you don't see with your own eyes. Maybe they just dismissed it as crazy people. Yeah, it definitely could be that as well. I could see that because if they don't even believe that it's anything real, then why would they use their resources to go and investigate when it sounds absolutely insane? Yeah, and maybe UFOs are not real. Let's say that completely made up. Well, what would they do? Yeah, it's kind of difficult. Or it's a big cover-up. We'll see. A 25-page report was made in 1992 called Details Surrounding a Large Stationary Object Above Montreal. It was compiled by UFO researcher Bernard Gignette, who was witness to the lights in the sky that night, and Richard F. Haynes, who was a former NASA scientist. The report gives detailed information about the event, when it took place, who saw it, as well as the various people involved. The report includes many sketches of what was observed in the sky that night and indicated that an object measured 540 meters wide was responsible for the beams of light. That is massive. That is half a kilometer. Yeah. So this thing was stretched out almost over half a kilometer wide. Sorry, United States. We are in metric. Multiple drawings were made by eyewitnesses in the report and generally look the same, which also adds to the credibility of the sighting. Hang on, how do they determine exactly how big it was? If they didn't have any radar or nothing. So it's all detailed in the report. They actually describe specifically how they were able to make the measurements. If you do want to know the specifics, I will also be posting the report in the show notes. So yeah, in order to make these measurements, it looks like in the report they used arm length of the individuals on the ground and they separated them based on the individual. And then they calculated the visual angle in order to determine one end of a light ray to the other end of another light ray and were able to settle on about 540 meters once the calculations were completed. Photo negative analysis was even conducted, which refers to density based on how transparent or opaque the exposed image is. The dark areas of the negative are the actual light areas in the real image and vice versa. The results suggested that this wasn't a light anomaly or effect, but something was actually in the sky above the hotel. The report mentioned that it was odd that nothing was done to investigate the phenomenon beyond what the police and RCMP had already done. No action of any kind was taken by the military even after being notified of the event, and apparently it wasn't even reported to the North American Radar Defense, also known as NORAD Communication Center. The report concluded with the following statement, quote, the evidence for the existence of a highly unusual, hovering, silent, large object is indisputable, end quote. An interesting fact that the report touches on is a strange event that occurred not long after the object was no longer able to be seen above the hotel. A man by the name of Pierre Comartin was driving home from work between 10.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. when he noticed some very odd lights and a strange luminous object in the shape of a boomerang, and it was situated low in the sky over the Olympic Tower. He indicated that the lights coming from the object were very big and strong. 
so strong that it illuminated the interior of his car as he drove. He arrived close to his home, which was near Long Point Military Base in Montreal. Sorry if I said that wrong. He watched as the object hovered above Hydro-Quebec Long Point Power Station. He exited his car and heard an audible purr in the night sky. The only answer he could muster from that moment was that it was a zeppelin of sorts and the cloud cover obscured the upper part of the craft so that only the gondola was visible. Interestingly enough, between 11.08 p.m. and 11.50 p.m., a power failure was experienced at the military base I just mentioned before, which is not a normal thing to happen, especially because the base is fed by its own electrical line from Hydro-Quebec. It was also the only line that broke down. Could this indicate that the UFO somehow disabled the power line going to the military base? Due to the credibility of many witnesses involved, such as police, as well as the photographic evidence of the object in the sky, the Hotel Bonaventure UFO incident is regarded as one of the most credible and widely reported UFO sightings in Canadian history. Everyone involved in the sighting reported seeing the same thing, and it matched the photographic evidence perfectly. CBC even went as far to make a documentary about the UFO sighting. There have been various theories made about the sighting, and we're going to go through some of them now. One such theory was that it was a helicopter flying overhead, and the sky was illuminated by searchlights. This theory was quickly debunked as helicopters are quite loud, and nobody heard anything, and the object was completely silent. The duration of the event would also be an extremely long time for a helicopter to sit in one spot. As for other aircraft, there was nothing at that time that could hover in place for an extended period, let alone three hours, ruling out other planes and similar aircraft. What about a blimp? Isn't it just passively floating there? The blimp would be for sure, but that was ruled out as nobody was sure about the lights. However, that is interesting that you bring that up because the story I just told you about Pierre, he said that it might be a blimp that was hovering over top of uh, the power station, but the top part of the balloon was obscured. However, at the same time, when they contacted the radar stations, there was no evidence or there was no indication that blimps were in the sky during that time, and it would have been picked up on radar. What about a hot air balloon? They don't think they would have enough lights. And you would also hear the torch, I think, going off all the time, would you not? In order to be stationary and sitting in that one spot, you'd hear probably something. Yeah, I suppose you're right. It's a pretty loud torch, like you said. Yeah. That would explain, I think, why it wouldn't be picked up by radar if it was a hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. I feel like the fabric is so thin it wouldn't pick up a radar signal. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. From what I did research, radar was effective at a certain height. So it wouldn't just pick up anything that was on the ground. It was above a certain elevation. I think it was something above a thousand feet or something like that it was able to pick up. I apologize if I'm wrong with that statement, but don't hold me to that. However, you did have to reach a certain elevation before the radar was effective. Yeah, you probably get a lot of uh, like artifact signals from closer to the ground with radar. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of interference. But also on top of that, I don't think hot air balloons could be that high. So that airplane that did travel under, that was at 1,200 feet. I don't think hot air balloons are able to go that high at the same time. Right. It's an out there theory, but we got to touch on all the bases. For sure. Probably one of the most natural explanations for the event was the Aurora Borealis, a beautiful display of dancing ribbons across the sky composed of wondrous colors. Also called the Northern Lights. Meteorologists who knew about this case investigated the possibility of such a phenomenon. The thing about the Aurora Borealis is that it is quite transient and moves a lot. It would be unlikely that the Aurora Borealis would be in one spot only and for three hours. From the report I mentioned earlier, they examined meteorological data at the time and concluded, quote, there is nothing about these particular meteorological conditions that could produce an optical effect of the kind described by the witnesses, end quote. It has also been shown that no unusual solar activity was recorded that night, making the chances of northern lights very low. Let's not rule out the fact that it's some unexplained natural phenomenon. Maybe there is some type of aurora borealis type light that is stationary that we haven't uh, discovered. We'll get to that theory in just a minute. 
Another interesting theory was that it was light, possibly from the pool or area surrounding Hotel Bonaventure, reflecting off the hazy sky that night. UFO researcher Chris Rutkowski discusses in an interview that possibly that night there might have been the perfect conditions that caused some light to be reflected, giving the impression that something was in the sky that night. There are certain light-scattering properties of water droplets formed in clouds that could have caused the light show. However, he also states that the phenomenon has never happened before November 7, 1990, and has never happened since. Another rare optical phenomenon called light pillars was also suggested as an explanation. Light pillars are the result of light reflecting off microscopic ice crystals in the air. It requires the proper temperature, humidity, kind of the culmination of the perfect settings. The source of light pillars is usually easy to find. However, there was no source able to be found to explain what people were seeing. Light pillars are usually cast over a large area, even entire towns, but this event was localized to the middle of downtown Montreal only. I think we have that sort of effect near our hometown. I've seen it before. Yeah, it does happen around the world, and that's the thing, but it's an extremely rare optical event. There was also a huge number of light sources near the hotel, but none of them caused the pillars. Despite all these theories, the alleged UFO sighting at Hotel Bonaventure is a mystery, and what exactly was seen in the sky remains unidentified to this day. In true Canadian fashion, can you guess what was made in 2021? Ooh, baby, we got a coin. The UFO sighting is presented on the fourth unexplained phenomena coin is a colorful glow-in-the-dark design which transports you to the rooftop pool at the Hotel Bonaventure in Montreal on the night of November 7th, 1990. Ooh, let's have a look. On the coin, the UFO's light beams are enhanced with black light paint technology which is activated by a flashlight included with this coin. A Fresnel optical effect alters the way light reflects on the coin depending on your viewing angle. I think they're all sold out. They originally were selling for around $130, but is I think there are 5,000 of these made. So it's very similar to the other coins that we've discussed before. But there you go. Another UFO sighting, another coin. How many? I wonder how many more coins we got. That'll t- determine the rest of our uh, Canadian UFO episodes. I'll have to do some more research and find that out. So of all the places a UFO would visit, why would it be Hotel Bonaventure in Montreal? One reason could be because of the sheer size of the gigantic structure. It was the largest building in the world at the time and could have attracted the aircraft due to its high visibility from high up. Maybe the building had a high gravity field from its size. Maybe. Actually, actually one cool thing, I was listening to a podcast with Hal Putoff, the guy I was telling you about, Mm -hmm. and he was talking about uh, some research that he was doing for like, uh, I forget if it was NASA or just some other. They wanted to determine if... Newton's like equations for gravity were completely accurate. Mm. So they built like this whole machine to measure gravity. And this thing was so sensitive. They got the most sensitive measurement for gravity like ever produced. Something to like like the billionth like sensitivity. He's like, this could measure a person walking by from a thousand feet away. Mm. Like the gravity the person produces. Well, that's weird. Yeah, really cool. So you're thinking more so that the sheer gravity of this because it was such a monumental structure and almost a stone monolith in its design that potentially this UFO was attracted to it? Maybe. Well, whether it was a UFO or some natural phenomenon, the mystery surrounding the event will be talked about for generations to come, but I'll let you decide what you believe it to be. I like this case because there's some ambiguity to it. With the cloud cover and all that, you don't really know what you were seeing which kind of adds to the mystery of it. Maybe it was some natural phenomenon. Maybe it was a prank or a hoax. Maybe it was an alien spaceship. Who knows? Yeah, I think in these cases in particular, it's almost more exciting just the mystery of it versus actually finding out what it is. Like, yeah, just that's the, some fun to it. Yeah, exactly. Just not knowing and trying to figure it out, that's a lot of fun. I think I've mentioned that in other episodes that we've done already, but... I feel like not knowing and just the mystery surrounding it is 
as exciting, if not more exciting. But at the same time, if you found out that a UFO was actually hovering over a city, I feel like some people's realities would crumble while other people would be really, really excited. Where would you be in that category of people? That's a good question. I would be probably excited, but also scared at the same time. I'd be excited because it's like, here's this civilization or something that we don't know about is here. And it's something that's been talked about for such a long time. And to finally find out that it is real after all this time, like the media, everything that's been going on in the last five years in terms of UFO or UAP, which is unexplained aerial phenomena, that all finalizing and getting a concrete answer, I think would be both exciting and scary at the same time. That's kind of happening today, though, like in the media. You've got like the Pentagon reporting on UAPs and all these news outlets and nobody's nobody cares. I think a reason for that is because of the generalized description of UFO. UFO, again, when people think UFO, they immediately think aliens. That's the first thing that comes to most people's minds. They don't think just an unexplained event that happened in the sky. There's been so much disinformation over the past, whatever, 70 years or so with like the U.S. government in particular misleading the public about supposed craft crashes and stuff like that. And now they're coming out and saying, yeah, it's real. But like they've lied to us for like 70 years. So it's hard to gain people's trust back with something so far out there. Oh, I definitely agree. So something I do want to circle back on that I didn't discuss yet was the military's involvement. These police officers who contacted the military and got a very lackluster response from them saying like, "Uh, no, we don't want to deal with it or whatever. In my mind, the military probably knows something about what was going on and they didn't want to talk about it. And after the event happened within 24 hours, the information pertaining to that event was classified. Yeah. So I also did a little extra research and I found that in Bangor, Maine, which is about five hours east or five hour drive to the east of Montreal, they were predominantly a aircraft base. So they harbored or they had a lot of aircraft there. Potentially, and it wouldn't surprise me if experimental craft were worked upon at that base in particular, and they had test flights over civilized populations. So if you look at the stealth bomber that was made by the Americans, it has a triangular shape, not necessarily lights on the bottom of it, but the one gentleman that I talked about, Pierre, who was driving home and he saw this triangular shaped object hovering over the hydropower station, that kind of resembles it a little bit. Not saying it's that exactly by any means whatsoever, but it kind of resembles the shape. Mm -hmm. But I would not be surprised if the military were running different training missions or different flights on experimental craft at the time and seeing what they could potentially get away with. Because the military says we don't fly over civilian populated areas. However, if they're trying to build something that has the intention of being stealthy, that's the perfect place to test it. Yeah, let's see how many reports we get over this night and that'll determine how stealthy we actually are. (laughs) Exactly. And the gentleman that was working in the airport radio tower or the radar tower, sorry, he said... Nothing has been picked up on our radar. If something was there, it would have to be stealth. So even he made that connection as well, which right. makes me think that some form of experimental craft might have been used that night. Yeah, maybe let's say it was an experimental craft. Maybe it malfunctioned and it was just stuck there for three hours. Yeah, no, oh, I definitely agree with that too. But once again, it is a mystery. Nothing has been identified. There have been no formal public documents made available, there's nothing. And most likely this event will remain a mystery for our entire lifetimes and other people's as well. What do you think if this military guy who answered the phone was just like a lazy, like 18 year old kid? Nah, I don't feel like dealing with it tonight. It wouldn't surprise me. I feel like somebody in that position, the less they know, the better, because they wouldn't slip up and say something that they weren't supposed to. <laughs> like, they're just like, you're going to man the phones. This is punishment for you Uh, waking up five minutes late and you (laughs) making it to breakfast or something (laughs) for training. Yeah, we get we get hundreds of UFO calls every night. This is your your uh, neck of the woods tonight, buddy. Exactly. I feel like it's a perfect scapegoat. It's a win win situation. Well, it's a lose situation for him, but it's a win win situation. We put somebody on the phone and they don't know much. It's a lose situation for the people calling. Ain't getting no help. The poor public. 
So based on everything that I have discussed, what do you think this thing was? Do you think it's aliens? No, it's probably it's probably not extraterrestrials. I don't I don't think it's like aliens, but hmm, probably some type of technology. I like to be you and I were talking about this the other day. I like to put out theories as wild as possible just to get people's minds out of the box. Yeah. Like a lot of the stuff I say is probably crazy and not true. But the fact that we're thinking about it and maybe something like this gets invented in the future. But And I think our view of physics is so... There's so much more that we have yet to discover that's possible. So that being said, Einstein's theories of like general relativity, the equations, it's possible to like travel through time. So we haven't figured it out yet, but by the math, like I feel like it's a, a trans-temporal dimension type thing. So you're kind of, so with the Shake Harbor episode that we did previously, I believe you said something along the same lines that it was some time traveling aircraft that has, it's kind of like the future us has come back in time in a sense. Am I correct? Yeah, that, that's sort of, yeah, not saying that is the case, but by, by the theories, the pure maths, I'm not a physicist, by the way. This is just... Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell by the way I said maths, plural. <laughs> but from my my limited understanding is that crazy things can can happen. So if you had to choose between the theories that I presented to you, which one would it be? I'm going to say it's some type of natural phenomenon. Like the light pillars or... Yeah, the... something like that. Just because we don't have a clear view of it with all the cloud cover. I feel like that's the more rational approach. Sorry, guys. I know you like my wild uh, theories, but I'm going to go with the uh, the natural f- phenomenon for this one. That's the thing, though. It's Even if it is crazy, this is not a solved case. So conventional means of explaining it clearly haven't worked. So it could be something just completely out there as well. You need people like me, crazy people, to push the boundaries of of what we think is possible. What do you think it is, Jared? I'm going to have to agree with you. I'm definitely on the side of light pillars or some isolated aurora borealis type event. Only because from everything that I've seen, that seems to be the most plausible explanation. Just some natural phenomenon that happened at the perfect time, the perfect settings, and that's why it was kind of a one-off. And it hasn't been seen before, and it hasn't been seen since. Yeah, it doesn't have to be UFOs all the time. But it still is quite an event, regardless, with the amount of coverage it got. I think Canada is just trying to put up some of their coin currency at this point. Oh, probably. At $130 a piece? Jeez. $179 now. Yeah, no kidding. Resale value. All right, so that's going to be it for our show tonight. If you have any ideas or want your story featured on the show, please email us at strangeandundecided at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. And good night. <laughs>